Hello, everyone. I'm Craig Partridge. I'm here to welcome you to our second session today on identifying and evangelizing emergent technical directions. I'm delighted that we have three wonderful panelists here who are going to briefly present their perspectives, and then we're going to open the floor to questions. And, and so I just want to introduce our panelists and then let them get going. So there is Liz Bradley from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, there's Chris Ramming from VMware. And there's Beth Minat from Northeastern. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Liz to start us off. Okay. Did that work? Oops. There we go. Okay. Let me. Um... So um, I welcome to everyone and um, thank you so much to the organizers for, for inviting uh, us slash me to this. Um, John Roklowski and I were TAs for like 6004 about three decades ago, so it was really nice to hear from him and get the invitation. It looks like a great event. Now, the charge to us as a panel was to examine how we as a community um, find our way to new research directions do it differently, presumably better. So I'm gonna concentrate, as you can tell from my slide on the how, um, with a bit about some cross-cutting themes that I think we really need to keep in mind during this process. Now, the obvious challenge with new, identifying new technical directions is we don't have crystal balls. This is actually a picture of one that I got off the Amazon website, but I don't think it takes care of ideation, unfortunately. So in, in the absence of crystal balls, everyone is making informed guesses. Um, many of those guesses will wrong, be wrong, but hopefully some will be right. Let's see if I can get this to advance. There we go. So the key in identifying new research directions is to increase the number of guesses and the good ones and to support them to fruition. That's blindingly obvious. Um, that is to make those guesses as numerous, as well-informed and as free ranging as possible and to offer broad-based long-term support for their development and fruition. And again, this is really obvious, but how? And there's the challenge. Making that first step, the ideation work, uh, begins with bringing different perspectives and people to the table. Um, and there'll be a connection here to, to my friend Beth's talk later on in this session. We need creators and customers at the table. We need people from different career stages, not just the old farts. We need the young people. They have different perspectives. They have different energy. They know more than we do. We need people from different parts of the ecosystem, academia, government, industry, and not just big tech, not just the Googles and the Amazons, but the smaller companies and not just the R1s on the coasts. We need the unknown people as well as the unknown ideas. Um, and when you're picking people to do this kind of stuff, you have to prioritize communication skills on the same level with, if not above, intelligence or knowledge or, God help us, how famous someone is, um, because you need people who listen as well as talk, people who are willing to reach across dogma and jargon and culture. This is essential. Now, my italics on that slide and this may be provocative and other people may disagree, but I believe that this kind of brainstorming can only happen in person, in smallish groups and on a non-crammed schedule. Um, so let me unpack that a little bit. Thoreau himself famously said, I like a broad margin to my life, a broad margin, the white space that lets creativity happen. We've all read those pieces of text that go out to half inch margins and it's 10 point font that you can't think that way. Uh, brainstorming needs space. It needs the coffee breaks where people can mull and connect. Um, and none of this start at 7 a.m. and run till 9 p.m. stuff. Let's just stop that forever. Now, regarding the in-person part, Zoom has totally saved our cookies for the past two or three years. It has lots of affordances, um, inclusivity, expense reduction, and that's not just dollars. It's also carbon from the travel but it is an impoverished communication channel to the one that we have evolved over the past N million years to use and to understand and to be able to, to relate to. Uh, and that has costs, which are starting to come out in the research. Um, I'm deeply worried about those effects on the creative exchange. Virtual, you know, Hublio, Gather, Zoom, everything works great for some things, and yeah, we can use breakout rooms and little potted plants, digital plants and avatars. 
to simulate some of that. And the chat facility allows some one-on-one -on -one stuff to happen, which is cool, but it's tightly channeled. It requires intention. Serendipity is very hard in these kinds of situations. And real human contact feels especially essential to me in the context of ideation. The second key to identify research directions is the support. And that's a real tightrope. You need to try lots of stuff, plant lots of different kinds of seeds, see what grows. But at the same time, you have to filter out the stuff that's not going to work, but you need to avoid nipping good things in the bud. Um, you know, the current computing landscape is full of things that people said would not work. So we need to be careful. And the structures, the incentives, and the timelines here are absolutely key. In my venue, academia, we have a blue sky research culture. We mostly play the long game. Indeed, we have test of time awards that reward that kind of thing, that make the, that call out that that's what's important. But the term of a DARPA, DARPA program manager is three years. And Chris will tell us about uh, the timelines in industry. Industry, you need results in 10, 12, 18 months. So that's a real challenge. Radical innovation is hard. It's bursty. I mean, think about Thomas Kuhn and the structure of scientific revolutions. So it happens quickly, but that's not all that you see. There's all this stuff that happens under the surface. So innovation rests on a foundation built over a possibly long period. And there's incubation, there's mixing, there's maybe there's fermentation, I don't know. So here I have to apologize to my friend Beth for using an old version of a chart these gonna, she, she, she is gonna show later. She had a lot of uh, important role in making a much better version of this. This is the tire tracks. Ponch actually mentioned this before, tire tracks. Time runs vertically. Um, the columns are the areas, you can read the titles. The color is the sector. Red is academia, blue is industry R&D. And then that right-hand column in each, of the sect in each of the areas is about products. Products are dots when they start to come out. When the sector becomes a $1 billion market, the dots turn into a green line. When the sector gets to be a $10 billion market, the, the, the line gets fat. Now, this is wildly out of date, and this is why Beth and uh, her group made a much better version of it. But um, you can clearly see the sequencing here, when things start and how they progress. So this is what Lewis Thomas called getting the soil right. He famously said, if you get the, the, sorry, get the air right, if you get the air right, the science will come in its own time like pure honey. So how do we get the air right as part of getting this diagram to work? Now, those gray curves that I don't know if you can see um, call out specific cross-fertilization instances between sectors and areas. Note that they go in lots of directions. And sometimes, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, they go in one way and then they go back. And academics might think that the red is always the base of the arrow and uh, all arrows lead out from academia and all knowledge starts in academia, but you can see from this diagram, that's not the case. So clearly the highly heterogeneous ecosystem in which computing research happens does provide opportunities, but there are also challenges because of the differences in incentives uh, alongside the timeline issues. So my stock and trade is journal papers. Um, you know, Chris has a, a, a event in Chris's area, things like, you know, products and views and things like that are more important. So there'll be a connection. He'll say much more about that. Okay, on to my cross-cutting themes, uh, bringing considerations about ethics and climate into computing researchers, re research, and I mean at all stages, not just plastered on post facto to check a box. And the first one I'll talk about is ethics. Um, computing nowadays is so deeply threaded through every part of society and the economy. And that's, there are huge affordances there um, and major powers and leverages, but there are also perils. So we have algorithms that can generate incredibly realistic images, um, but that lets bad actors uh, produce deep fakes that fuel misinformation and disinformation. We have algorithms that can spot kiddie porn. But you may have seen the recent articles in the New York Times and elsewhere about the guy who sent a photo of his kids' privates to the family doctor and got flagged by Google, leading to a police report and the removal of all of his accounts, which I'm not even sure he's gotten back yet. 
So there are some issues there. Um, part of the response to this that's really encouraging to me is a, a report commissioned by the National Academies, led by Barbara Gross, that addresses many of these issues in great detail. This report is hundreds of pages long, but I would encourage you to look at it, at least read the executive summary. It's really good stuff. Barbara pulled together a great group. And the report points out, this is interesting, that there are two ecosystems involved in the advances here, technology, innovation, and computing research, all together, tied together, with ideas flowing between them, like the tire tracks. It makes lots of recommendations regarding ethical and societal considerations in computing, um, in integrating those into computing, and not just in research, but also in education to get the, the, the um, get things coming, flowing up from the beginning. Key challenges, at least to my reading in this thing, um, and this, I can't emphasize this enough, you cannot uh, ethics wash things. You cannot take something that you, you've, you've built and then say, post facto, let's put a layer of ethics around it. That just doesn't work. It has to be built in from the start not just pro forma box checking and not just shuffled off to the three people in the ethics office over there that, the, that you're, uh, you're requiring to deal with all of this. And this goes to something that Panch talked about this morning. This is a socio-technical problem with all of the hardnesses that come with that. Um, we CS geeks have no sociology or ethics training and those in the humanities and social sciences don't know what are, what's inside a computer I mean, to first approximation. So how to bridge that gap? I will refer you to this report about more um, for more about this, and it's on the National Academy's press website uh, if you want to take a look. Here's another point. Some of those algorithms that make those ethically questionable decisions require just a ton of energy to train. Um, and that's a good segue to my second cross-cutting theme, which is computing in the age of climate change. And this goes well beyond making a better PDE model to simulate how and when the ice is going to melt and what the level of sea rise is going to be if we lose the East Antarctic ice sheet, et cetera. That's really great stuff, and that's the first bullet here. But there's a lot of other stuff. So consider, for example, energy. Algorithms to juggle um, dynamic, heterogeneous energy sources and needs in real time. Uh, justice, environmental justice, data sets and models that can properly capture and expose equity aspects, hidden biases, and economic factors. Transportation, imagine things that uh, algorithms for modeling and optimization, optimizing flows of energy, traffic, goods, people, pollution, et cetera, around a world um, whose climate is changing with all of the ickiness that comes with socio-political reactions to all of that stuff. There's a white paper that was produced by the Computing Community, Community Consortium about this, and I would refer you to that white paper for more about some of those issues. And if you're interested, the CCC has been funded by the National Science Foundation to run what's called a Convergence Accelerator Workshop about this over the next couple of months. This is inside the new TIP directorate, and the goal of this Convergence Accelerator Workshop process is to come up with a new theme for these Convergence Accelerators. Um, and what that'll be is um, a small in-person workshop followed by a larger virtual event an intent in, um, an interest, in the interest of getting around some of my ranting about how we really need to have people in the room to do brainstorming. So I'll wrap up now. Um, you all know this, but computing um, has and will continue to change the world. And we need all hands on deck to make that go in the right direction. And we need to recognize that this is not a narrow, purely geek technical challenge. It's a social technical challenge and we need the SBE people involved in this. So thank you. I saw Chris coming on, or Craig coming on to probably shut me up. So there you go. No, actually I was enjoying your talk immensely. I just had the sense you were winding down and I needed to pass the baton to okay. Chris. So um, I'll ask you to stop sharing and let Chris load up his presentation. And while Chris does that, I will remind everybody who's participating that there is a Q&A panel in Hublio and that we welcome you posting questions at any time. In fact, earlier is better because then I can sort through them to some degree and relay them along to our panelists and give you a more informed answer. With that, I pass it over to Chris. Chris, I'll note you are currently muted. Thank you for that reminder, Craig. 
All right. So uh, thank you, everybody. I, I have really enjoyed having conversations um, leading up to this event. Um, it feels like we're at a time in history when we can actually um, you know, brainstorm some new ideas and do something about them. So it's a very timely convocation. Um, you know, I think a lot of people here have a personal process for identifying and evangelizing research directions. So I want to talk a little bit about that, but I want to spend most of my time um, you know, on the question of how research ideas and themes are generated and amplified um, across time and space and through different organizations. And since we're here a little bit to brainstorm, I wanted to maybe uh, use um, uh, uh, an analogy, maybe to um, sort of spark ideas. Um, Chris, do you mean your slides to be visible? They're not yet. Ah, so, so they're not. Thank you for asking. All right, how about now? Yep. Okay, so as I was saying, I'm sort of trying to think a little bit about um, not just individual research choices, but how themes are amplified across time and space. And what I thought would be kind of fun, um, and what's uh, given me some um, ideas, is to just pick an analogy um, and see if it leads to anything useful. And so the analogy that I had in my head was um, research ecosystem as fugue. And um, uh, I think this is kind of interesting um, and uh, gave me some thoughts. Um, so let's think a little bit about research ideas as the subject of a fugue. If you've listened to Bach, you, uh, you hopefully know that um, themes and subjects um, in a fugue are reiterated and amplified and uh, turned on their heads and played with counter subjects. And the whole idea of counterpoint is this rich interplay between, um, between musical ideas um, that, that um, eventually come to fruition in some, you know, um, uh, some interesting cadence. Um, so uh, so this, is, um, this is something that I can sort of see in the research ecosystem and um, in, a, in a counterpoint, um, uh, different voices are played sometimes by different instruments. And here I'm sort of imagining that it's interesting to think about uh, voices not as musical instruments, but as organizations like DARPA and the NSF and startups and industry and different sectors, government and academia and nonprofits, each of which um, uh, play a different role. So how do these ideas um, evolve and become great fugues and how can we have a big impact with our research? So just a quick review. I mean, I think we all know and see many examples of pure curiosity-driven research, which Punch mentioned, and um, some of the um, some of the astro astronomical um, uh, uh, events of the last six months are great examples of that. Um, Claude Shannon had this idea that um, he wasn't interested in applications and just the elegance of a problem. So he's maybe an epitome of this idea, and um, and he. Uh, he had enormous impact with curiosity-driven research. Um, but there are other models and other um, role models to think about. Um, I joined Bell Labs about a year before um, Richard Hamming gave his famous speech, You and Your Research. And um, he gave um, sort of a summary of what he had learned by studying people um, and their research practices. And these notes have sort of stood the, stead of the, the test of time. Um, and his approach was very much problem oriented. He wanted to work on the right problem. And he thought it was extremely important, not just to pick something that sounds good, um, uh, but that where you actually have what he called an attack on the program. And um, he had this idea that sometimes you, know, you can take an idea like our few themes and subjects and turn them around and, turn and, and um, play with them until you get to something that is an interesting um, uh, uh, result. Now, um, in the late 90s, um, a political scientist and science historian, Donald Stokes, um, came up with um, a really interesting observation that people had begun to think of uh, basic research and um, applied research as being um, in somehow, in some sense, incommensurable. And, um, and that you really had to protect basic research and curiosity-driven research from practical stuff, otherwise it wouldn't do well. 
And so his, um, his, the main point of a, a short pamphlet he wrote, um, which is definitely worth reading, is that these two things are not in conflict. And he cited a number of um, scientists, Pasteur being the leading example, that showed that in fact, you can do fundamentally, um, you can look at fundamental understanding and applied work in at the same time. And he didn't mean by any means to, to sort of downplay the value of basic research. He was simply pointing out that basic research is not in conflict with application. And um, I always think of David Patterson as being a role model in the computer science um, field. I mean, his work on risk and RAID and now have resulted both in fundamental understanding and huge um, industry impact. And um, so, you know, a lot of great insight about generating ideas at a personal level. Um, um, but let's look now at how ideas go from one person's head to becoming a multi-billion dollar industry. And um, if you do get a chance to look at Stokes' book, um, if you haven't read it yet, um, you know, uh, Pester's Quadrant, um, is the way he looked at how funding agencies are kind of like people in that they have their own approach and their own philosophy of what kind of research they want to pursue. And um, so, you know, again, I want to move into this idea of thinking about funding agencies in different sectors that amplify an idea to do research translation and innovation and actually have an impact. So um, to be concrete, um, Ponch talked a little bit about SDN and how hard that was to get funded. Um, there is a fantastic sort of intellectual history of SDN that I think many of you have probably looked at, and I think it's a great sort of um, uh, paper to read as you're thinking about research management and the, the research enterprise in the United States. And it, um, you know, has sort of this musical subject, which is software-defined networking, and there's a counter subject, which is the closely related theme or idea of, um, uh, uh, of uh, network virtualization. Um, and these two ideas um, play out over the course of decades. And, um, you know, it's, there's a couple of interesting things that aren't in this paper that I want to highlight a little bit. Um, first is, um, you know, just, it's obvious. Um, this, is, this is something that has taken 20, 30 years to, uh, to unfold and is still in, evolving. And um, so we have to be prepared to think about nurturing an idea over very long time scales. Um, the second thing that's mentioned, but um, is not a big focus of the paper, is that different organizations were involved in this story at different points in the evolution of software-defined networking. Um, DARPA started a lot of this work in the context of active networks, um, and um, it explored ideas in network virtualization that were picked up later on in other ways. Um, and so um, as some of the ideas in the early active networks um, uh, uh, work um, evolved, um, they were taken up by different organizations. Um, for example, some of the ideas in uh, test beds and network virtualization in uh, the active networks program um, were picked up um, later on by a consortium of academics and industries um, uh, in the Planet Lab experiment, which, as you know, was the basis for a large amount, a large fraction, actually, of the, um, of the research at SIGCOM for um, quite a few years. And um, Planet Lab sort of, um, uh, you know, reiterated some of the ideas like um, uh, network virtualization based on demultiplexing packet headers, um, and uh, that those ideas uh, were picked up by the National Science Foundation, which um, took sort of the next um, uh, turn at this with Genie. And um, there was a lot of work that was informing test beds and actually became, um, you know, practically useful in a broader context because being able to run experiments is very much like um, being able to run uh, multi-tenant networks. So, um, you know, um, there were, um, uh, well, ideas that were um, uh, built, um, picked up, morphed, transformed, and it's this enormous few. Um, at one point, OpenFlow um, was being well received by operators and equipment providers and academics and um, other kinds of companies. And so that's almost like a stretto in a few. Um, so the point I want to make here is that um, I think the United States is successful um, uh, in its research enterprise in part because of the diversity of its research, um, uh, its research ecosystem. 
And there are a lot of examples um, that I've seen where DARPA with its very focused project orientation inspires new basic research proposals at, at, the, at the foundation. And conversely, NSF ideas are often the basis of confidence for DARPA programs. Um, um, and when I was at Intel, we had two organizations to sponsor university research. One that was styled after the NSF to help ask the right questions. And the other one, which was styled a little bit more after DARPA, to help answer the important questions. And I think that a good research ecosystem um, might benefit from the de deliberate design of organizations with different focuses that interact, not necessarily concurrently, but in time to unfold these large, few, these, these large fugues. Um, so um, another thing I wanna point out in this example um, is the role of uh, visioning groups um, and convenings. And uh, one thing that's um, actually to the left of the timeline in the SDN story is um, a, a, a DARPA ISAT study. ISAT is uh, DARPA's visioning, um, uh, one of DARPA's visioning organizations, sort of ISAT is to um, I2O as uh, the CCC is to the NSF. And this group um, convened a study team to sort of think about this idea of virtual infrastructure. And they elaborated a lot of the stuff that um, turned directly into the active networks program. And um, it's kind of an interesting, you know, uh, who's who of participants there, both in that and in this later Planet Lab underground meeting um, between um, Intel Research and um, a number of academics. And, um, and I think that, um, these convenings where we bring multidisciplinary groups together and people across different sectors and organizations are a key part of an effective ecosystem. Um, and another thing I think is interesting to look at here is that, that some of these people like deliberately moved from sector to sector, like Scott was an academic, but he spent time with his startup. Um, David Tenenhaus has been a professor and a VC and worked at Intel and uh, Microsoft and um, VMware and uh, was the director of DARPA's I2O. Um, moving people around is a way of moving ideas around and uh, doing that in time is one of the things that made, I think, the SDN story work out well. So these groups are catalyzing forces and a key part of sort of, um, sort of the story. Now today, I would want to be, um, you know, uh, by the uh, remind you that um, Richard Hemming um, in that note um, was very picky about where he ate lunch and um, which tables had the most exciting ideas. And um, you know, in some sense, these visioning groups are like lunch tables. But I want to sort of call attention to the fact that these could have been much more diverse lunch tables. And I think today we need to be paying a lot more attention to making sure that um, you know, we have a broad variety of, of views as um, Liz pointed out a little while ago. Okay, I don't have um, too much more to go into, but um, let me just sort of say a couple of words. So, um, you know, again, organizations have their own research philosophy. Some of them focus on different things. And I guess in, in, to some extent, vive la difference. Um, it's good that um, we have this diversity of uh, organizations, just as it's good to have diversity in human um, uh, social settings. and. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the idea of these um, differences is not one that needs to be coordinated concurrently in time. I think that you can see through um, examples like SDN that um, collaborations happen over time, if not formally. And um, what we might want to think about in this group here is how we pass the baton from organization to organization and how we deliberately structure these um, sort of the, the uh, research enterprise to um, be able to, uh, to build an idea to its fruition. Um, so um, where does evangelization come into play? Um, you know, that too has both a, an individual view and a research enterprise view. And from an individual view, um, you know, I think every great researcher that you look to will tell you how important it is um, uh, I'll just read Patterson's quote here, in the marketplace of ideas, the more polished, the more likely people will pay to the attention, of, you know, will pay attention to your ideas. Um, so I think it's clear that we need to focus on um, not just having ideas, but explaining them well. And a huge problem that we have today is that there are so many ideas that it's hard to listen carefully to hear um, which ones are important and which ones are worth amplifying and 
uh, repeating and, um, and building over time into um, a great few. And um, Vannevar uh, Bush, um, you know, many, many decades ago already felt like um, it was an overwhelming problem. And um, so we need to think a little bit about how we're going to be um, calling um, uh, some of these ideas and, uh, and, and building on the right ones. And I think there's a really interesting research problem by itself there. So um, near final thought, um, you know, this is um, from John von Neumann, um, who you know, talked a little bit about how um, science might want to move from intensity, substance, and energy to um, structure, organization, information, and control. And maybe for purposes of brainstorming today and tomorrow, we can think a little bit about that. Um, OK, so and the very last thing, um, I want to come back to this fugue. Um, take a look at bars 14 and 15, where a theme is played upside down um, for, I mean, it's, it's played, it's played upside down, it's played at half speed and it happens all at the same time. And um, it's not easy to hear that um, unless you really listen for it, but um, try it sometime and, um, and take, you know, just see uh, if, as we think about the research ecosystem, we can hear things that, um, that are important um, and, and, may, and maybe be very deliberate about creating those effects in the future. So that's all I have today. Thank you, Chris. Very much appreciate it. Um, and so if you can unshare your screen and let Beth step in, we will pass the baton at this point to Beth. And while Beth is getting her slides up, she already did. All right, I will just mention quickly that we are seeing some questions already in the Q&A. Thank you, and we will get to those. And I encourage more. And Beth, you are up. Thank you. Terrific, thank you. And it's a, it's a real pleasure to be in the session and appreciate uh, Liz and Chris's remarks. Um, as mentioned very early on at the beginning of the symposium, uh, my name is Beth Minot. I am the relatively new, as of January, Dean at the Corey College of Computer Sciences at Northeastern University. Um, and also, as was mentioned, our, our mission is computer science for everyone. And what you already know about us is all of our educational programs, combined majors, the Align program that seeks to um, increase the accessibility of computer science education across the nation and beyond. But today I wanna to talk about what it means for our mission and vision of computer science for everyone from the perspective of research and not really just focusing on Northeastern, but really just taking advantage of my experiences throughout my career and framing kind of a, a different perspective, and I think complementary perspective to what you heard from Liz and Chris today. So as, as Ponch and others mentioned in, in the opening remarks by John, you know, historically computer science research focused on what I would call the sheer act of creation uh, to fuel and inspire innovation. And this resulted in tremendous, uh, just transformative projects across the US and beyond where the vision of what we could create uh, with computing technologies fueled uh, tremendous advances. Um, I was lucky enough to be at Xerox Park towards the uh, close of the heyday of ubiquitous computing work. You know, there was the Andrew Project at CMU and others, and just even much of the sheer invention of the internet uh, was our inspiration for what would we would love to create and what we thought would uh, be of interest uh, to a general technology-oriented community. And it led to all sorts of framings, uh, including the phrase that um, was always a little terrifying about how we should eat our own dog food um, from the perspective of creating these living laboratories um, and that sheer act of inventing the future through creation. And this ethos then continued to move into the growing business world and eventually led to mottos such as move fast and break things um, from the perspective of through that sheer act of disruption, through that sheer act of creation, um, we could accomplish a great deal, even though computing was becoming more and more intertwined with everyday life and societal priorities. So the perspective that I want to bring forward is that there's another way to think about how to frame and inspire and structure uh, the support from computer science research. And for today, I'm going to just call this education from human experience which is instead of focusing on the early adopters, instead of focusing on designing and creating for ourselves, where do we find um, opportunities for co-creation and inspiration by looking at and examining and partnering with different aspects of human experience? 
Of course, accessibility research has had a long history of producing innovations in computing and beyond that were inspired by working with people with disabilities. Everything from the first uh, self-powered uh, uh, essentially wheelchair carriage that actually inspired bicycles uh, to my much beloved OXO tools in the kitchen, and then many, many examples that are within our computing fabric. Um, and of course, we're familiar with NIH and others where medical research regularly focuses on specific conditions um, and uh, looking for the opportunities for medical breakthroughs. And by focusing on education, what that does is that inspires creativity and enables a sharp focus on a specific phenomena, and in particular, often a specific phenomena that is not uh, one of your own, but one that requires kind of an additional insights and perspective to understand and to innovate. And especially within computing, but the edge keeps on moving. So, you know, back in the late 90s, when I joined Georgia Tech to look at the focus of um, computing in the home environment, that was a particular edge case. And of course, computing in home environments is not so edgy uh, as it was before. But if we look, um, and I had a great time going down a rabbit hole this week and preparing for this talk, once we start to look for these types of research projects, uh, we find them throughout our community. Folks who've worked in accessibility and home and health research, uh, individuals who have embraced uh, the needs of underserved communities or communities that suffer bias and discrimination in society and then often amplified uh, through technologies. Um, to looking at uh, the support for older adults, uh, as well as uh, pushing further into the future of work. So we see work, uh, research around the focus of online workers in crowd uh, environments and online computing environments. And then the emphasis about, you know, what happens when you look at rural agriculture, and especially if you look at small scale rural agriculture, as opposed to the major agribusiness, all of this research has pointed to opportunities to invent new types of computing technologies and new types of computing approaches. Um, and then as someone who came from the HCI tradition, it, it is important for me to, to point out, this is not just human computer interaction. This is not quote unquote, just application research, but it's digging deep into these types of edge cases, these types of contexts, and then coming forward with innovations in computer science that is all the way from networking to AI, to cryptography, to, to systems, um, as well as data analytics, AI, machine learning, and HCI and others. And so I refer to this as innovation up and down the stack that we see in our community, but is not necessarily um, easily supported. I mean, I'm gonna talk to you about that. So uh, Liz showed uh, the older tire tracks. This is the newer tire tracks, which focuses on the ecosystem of understanding how uh, research and engagement within computing research both uh, impacts the computing industry and beyond. In particular, it points to this notion of confluence, which is how innovations in our uh, community are combined with deep domain design, expertise, production, new business models, and they create transformative results around our community and around the US economy as a whole. And so when we start to look at this notion of edge cases or, or working with underserved populations, tremendous opportunities in agriculture and automotive, e-commerce, health, entertainment, and so on. Um, it's just easy to see how the results of our work can have a large economic impact across these sectors. And then sticking to the fundamentals of the tire tracks itself, it's also easy to see again up and down the stack how innovations and research and work done in these edge cases, working with underserved populations has resulted in major innovations within our system. And it's very different than the types of innovations that we would normally see within kind of an early adopter designing for ourselves uh, type of phenomena that we grew up with in the kind of the traditions and the laboratories that we were all trained in. So I wanna spend some time on this talk, not just evangelizing uh, for this particular framing around research, but then also talking candidly about what it means to enable this. Um, because it is not as quote unquote simple as uh, imagining what would be really interesting, working with technical colleagues and creating uh, all sorts of um, computing innovations that we share in our lab and we share from the perspective of early adopters and uh, fast adoption within the business ecosystem. 
Um, when you are engaging with authentic members of underserved populations, it requires additional work, additional deliberation, additional resources um, and framing to make that successful. So for example, uh, one of the things that we've looked at in uh, the perspective of CCC white papers and others is just even having access to and engagement with these communities is an additional layer of investment that must be made. Um, and then there are a tremendous number of methods out there for participatory co-creation and others that enables a meeting of the minds and coming together uh, for looking for inspiration and innovation within computing research. Um, likewise, in a nod to Liz's talk already, this question of you know, what does it mean in terms of ethical research in these spaces and working with, in many cases, at-risk populations. Um, and there are um, really important resources that are now out there in our community, for example, about what does it mean to work with people who are likely to be vulnerable to doxing on the internet? And what does it mean to create new ways of um, identity management um, and new ways of structuring security and privacy when this is a lived experience for a subset uh, of the population within the US and beyond. And from that, I, I also want to bring up the second major point, which is that this is something I've had to learn and many, many others have had to learn, um, especially when you look at computing as like a, a really awesome hammer uh, looking for great nails. Um, you cannot rely on a deficit fix-it framing. Um, it's patronizing uh, to come in and say, what is your problem and how can I fix it? Um, and it also misses much of the innovation space. So just as we might look at questions of automation and when you attempt to automate something, you typically can't automate all of it. And so you end up missing opportunities as opposed to stepping back and saying, what is the work? What is the activity that we need to uh, fully embrace here? And what are opportunities for innovation in that space? So when you're working uh, from this edge perspective with underserved populations, you need to use um, essentially capability or value-centric models. These are out there, Liz mentioned, uh, working within the social sciences. Many of them come from the social sciences. Um, and I've, I've, I've run into many that are, are quite helpful from a, an assistive technology, uh, looking and understanding the research within disability studies, um, and even my recent work with the LGBTQ population around uh, radical positivity, that all of this cannot come from a, well, there's a problem, there is something wrong with you, and here, how can I help uh, make that better? Um, so these framings are incredibly important, not just for the innovation space, but for the, the needed respect and engagement within these communities. And so it, it is important to realize that this level of multidisciplinary collaboration again, takes works and resources. And there's one uh, white paper uh, that I'm particularly proud of, uh, co-authored between the size and SBE advisory committees on what it means for us to create these types of collaborations. Um, and one of the, and I, it's not the same kind of unicorn as in, the, uh, as in the startup space, but we refer to this notion of don't count on unicorns to quote, stay the day. You have to build up cross-cutting research capabilities. And in this case, we're referring to unicorns to being like the lone researcher that is somehow able to amass all of this into their head uh, and into their laboratory. Um, that's rare and that's asking way too much of those individuals. You have to create a space for innovation. Um, and so I'm gonna close with an example. Um, this is from AI Caring. Ponch mentioned uh, the AI Institutes in his overview. And so this is an AI Institute focused on longitudinal and collaborative AI interactive systems but uh, our focus is on working with older adults with mild cognitive impairment um, and the support for older adults in their home. And so what we have invented within the Institute is what we're calling arenas. And these are a mechanism to bring together AI use inspired, edge inspired researchers for how do we foster collaboration. And I think we need to have greater discourse on what it means to actually bring individuals together because just data, just scenarios, just good intentions, um, and even just the right people on the team is not going to be enough. And so this is something that we have been innovating even within our own institute to make this possible. So just for fun, here are some of the arenas that we're working on uh, this year. Everything from kind of traditional longitudinal assessment in the home to how do you um, amplify and support uh, kitchen and social activities uh, and beyond. So in summary, 
I want to close with saying that we come from a tradition of build it to prove it, early adopters. Um, and that's part of our part of that initial DNA uh, that I think we need to, in some sense, uh, reflect and perhaps fight against in terms of how we frame and thinking about this, this future of computing research as we move from adolescence, uh, as was said in the, in the initial remarks. Um, and we have opportunities, especially with the academic and federal investment to focus on underserved populations. It will yield creative innovations and more importantly then also uh, should be yielding societal gains for us as well. Um, this is innovation up and down the stack. It's not just application, it's not just HCI, um, and it's even more than just use inspired, but it's a deliberate focus on bringing um, computer science uh, to everyone. Um, we have to avoid being patronizing uh, in our potential fix it approaches um, and and really build up deep and sustained collaborations. Um, and that's gonna require different types of infrastructure and different types of support by NSF and others uh, to build up those capabilities. So Craig, back to you and to the group. And um, again, thanks for uh, this terrific discussion today. You bet. So let's get to that terrific discussion. So I remind everybody uh, on the panel to unmute your mic so we can actually hear what you have to say. Um, so I'm going to start with the questions in the Q&A panel. I know there's been some instinct to answer them directly, but I think better to do it as a bit of a discussion. So uh, uh, Lane, Dr. Lane Hubbard, in response to Liz's talk, uh, points out that the punch in the Q&A mentioned the importance of bringing other disciplines into the fold of computing and information sciences and collaborating with MSIs, and how does that interact with ethics and climate. So Liz, I'll let you go first as the starting place. Sure, and I tried um, answering Lane in the chat and then I ran out of characters and it cut me off. Um, for other people who are responding in the chat, there's a very small, it's like, a, and I don't do Twitter, so I'm not good at that. Anyway, um, I'm, uh, you know, the, the climate change thing and ethics, um, as I mentioned, and we all know this, the, um, underserved communities are going to be the ones that really get slammed by climate change, by rising water, by pollution, by energy issues. Um, and so the first reaction is to say, well, of course we need MSIs involved in there. But then you get into the situation, and Beth, you know about this, um, every committee needs a woman on it to fix the women issues. And every committee that's kind of supposed to fix, fix uh, uh, you know, uh, black issues is supposed to have the black people are supposed to chair that committee. It's like, no, we need to not do that. So involving them yes but not with this traditionally you know and beth i'm sure you can amplify that a lot and then the piece of lane's question that i did not get to answer because i ran out of characters um other disciplines into the fold of computing and information sciences um with climate change that i mean that's uh that absolutely is key because it's a systems level problem and, and it impacts every and it should impact every possible aspect of science and engineering, and, and all of those people need to be brought into that. So, yeah. So, Beth, do you have anything more to say about this business of the, uh, you know, the, the girls have to fix the girl issues? <laughs> right, and I think, again, we have to go back to some fundamentals about what it means to support researchers being able to do this work. Almost everyone I mentioned in kind of my informal survey and the, the folks that I've talked to have almost all described kind of doing this work despite the lack of support, doing this work despite kind of the uh, uh, the uh, the additional burden uh, that that we place on communities, and so if you know if we can create you know collaborations that allow for you know the big gun computing companies to interact with NSF researchers, right? How do we actually create the infrastructure around minority serving institutions around um, I was reading about kind of the, uh, uh, there's an organization that represents uh, small dairy farms, um, and they're really excited about robotics and the role of robotics in continuing dairy farming traditions. Um, and it would be great for us to understand how to invest in those communities and invest in those interactions. When we did the white paper, the CCC white paper on inclusive access to um, uh, something like internet content, um, one of the things we talked about was so many researchers would say, okay, 
I don't even know how to reach out, right? Who, who and how and how to support that. So we have some like level zero capabilities uh, that we need to build up. And then we need to build up sufficient training uh, for how to have these collaborations to be productive, respectful, balanced, um, to be able to go forward. Because if, you know, again, if we're walking in and saying, hey, we're smart, we can fix it, um, that turns off uh, the exchange almost immediately. So can I take a moment to add to that? And, you know, I'm, I'm funded, you know, to actually from Northeastern to uh, lead a substantial diversity program on campus. And one of the things that I think people underestimate is that simply getting to know people, getting to know the community and talking with them is the first part. It's not that suddenly you, you, know, you start to understand the community that you wish to work with and how they see things and how it might work. And then suddenly miraculously everything happens. In fact, the next steps, there are usually next steps. Um, and often those next steps are extremely expensive. And this is one of the problems that I keep beating my head against in diversity communities and why I'm actually grateful for the Northeastern funds um, is Northeastern freed us from this world in which the assumption was that funding a few meetings to get people together to understand was going to miraculously cause all of the other issues to work out. In fact, you have to invest more once you know rather than less on making things happen. And I'm happy to make that concrete, but I didn't want to take too much time from our panelists and talking about it. And I see it provoked Liz to put, uh, sorry, Beth put her hand up. Uh, and so I want to give Beth the opportunity to, to, to tell me I'm crazy or whatever it is she wanted to say in response. Thanks, Greg. And I just, I really just wanted to amplify what you were saying, which is, you know, part of our tradition in NSF proposals is to already have figured out the problem and probably half the solution as we propose it. Um, and so that eliminates the ability to do this pre-work, uh, to do this, not only just relationship building, but shared language and shared understanding so that you can begin to do the co-creation. And we have, not, we have not invested enough in kind of the resources to actually even enable these kinds of conversations and to sustain them, right? So it can't be, you know, here, let's, you know, I'm gonna take a bunch of your time with some really intensive meetings, for six months and then I'm gonna disappear while I cross my fingers um, and hope that you know, some proposal is funded uh, you know, six months or a year down the road. So we, we have to get to that shared discovery phase and we have to figure out a way to, to get investments into, into that phase. So just really amplifying what you're saying, Craig, and then sustaining, sustaining, sustaining. So we got this provoked, this line of discussion provoked several more questions. So I'm gonna go down this line a little bit and then I'm gonna come back to some issues that I think cropped up in some of the other aspects of our presentation. But um, there's, um, a, well, first of all, uh, David Ballinson knows there's a lot of talk about the need for multidisciplinary research, um, psych sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists, et cetera, with computer science, but it seems easier said than done and how can the community, both NSF and research institutions, and I would add to that, David, if you'll permit DARPA, um, which I think doesn't do this enough sometimes, uh, develop truly multidisciplinary programs and projects. So anybody, uh, Liz has her hand up. You want to take it first and then Chris? And you're muted, Liz. There we go, sorry. Um, having read through the National Academies report, there's, a, there's, a, there's pages and pages about this in there. And those pages start with the need to not expect the computer scientists to individually become experts in the, the other, the anthropology and so on and so forth, because that won't work. And also not to just have NSF programs or whatever that require you to have one a pet sociologist on your team and, that, and you pat them on the head every now and then and whatever. But no, there's, there's pages and pages of recommendations in that report about how to do that that I couldn't possibly synopsize, but I would refer you to that. Okay, Chris, you're, you're muted somehow, Chris. Your microphone just dropped out. There you are. Sounds like I can hear you now. Whoops, still no, sorry. Maybe Beth should go in the meantime. 
Yeah, I think that's right. Beth, want to go while Chris gets his audio working again? Yeah, so again, and maybe we can get it in the chat, would um, really refer folks to the size SPE report. Uh, this was a tremendous set of workshops and discussions that unfortunately hit uh, in March 2020. Uh, so quick pivot, quick pivot to virtual, but it really goes through kind of structurally many of the challenges um, that we need to, you know, that, that we need to acknowledge and, and work on in terms of size SBE collaborations. Um, two things I want to point out. One is just um, you also have to spend time, you have to spend time coming together in kind of the, the domain space and understanding that. You also have to spend time coming together in, let's say, the research scholarly space. You know, we publish these crazy deadline driven conference papers, um, they and Liz, but, you know, within social sciences, it's around kind of the major journal papers or it's around the books. Our grad students are well funded. Um, and we teach a couple of classes, their grad students are not funded at all and they're busy TAing. And by the way, the professors are you know, teaching twice of the course load. There's just so many expectations and differences in our research cultures that we also have to figure out um, and, and work with. The one thing I wanna call attention to because I've been in so many conversations about we need to get the computer scientists together with the social scientists is that a number of our institutions have um, uh, graduate uh, education programs in human-centered computing in, you know, in the I schools. They go by a variety of names, but you, you, know, you see it at Georgia Tech, Michigan, uh, Carnegie Mellon, UW, and others. We do have people who are in our field that have kind of trained within the methods to be in that middle space. Um, and we need to acknowledge that these folks exist and figure out how to bring them into uh, both kind of the training and research opportunities here. So it shouldn't be, you know, card carrying computer scientists, card carrying social scientists, put them in a room and wait for the magic to happen. Um, but we need to, to draw from kind of the greater capabilities uh, with, you know, across computing and information sciences to make that uh, possible. Cool. Chris looks like it's connected though muted. So you want to try again? Unmute and say Try again here. Can you hear me? You got it. Go. All right. Okay. I was no. I was gonna. Um, I was gonna uh, point out that I that these um, visioning groups that I mentioned earlier, like ISAP, are a great tool for trying to convene multidisciplinary communities. And you know, there's been sort of a longstanding conventional wisdom that by convening multiple communities, you actually end up with more interesting ideas. So that you know, I think is really worthwhile. Um, but I was you know, deeply inspired by Seni Camaro's talk at Crypto 2020, a couple, uh, which was a couple of years ago now. Um, and he talked about um, how um, cryptography and some database research had not really served marginalized communities well. And it was very thought provoking to me. Um, and uh, uh, the, the insight that our research problems themselves need to be chosen very carefully in order to um, um, meet the needs of people other than ourselves, who may, you know, I think we always think of ourselves as being, um, you know, good subjects for the research or, or recipients or beneficiaries. Um, but but this, this business of reaching out and really getting to know another problem seems like it's fundamental to making any progress in this area. Yeah. Thank you. So this, you just brought us to a, tied us to another question, which is you talked about bringing groups together. And I want to tie that with something Liz said and a question from my friend Rod in the Q&A, which is to say what much of the focus has naturally been in the U.S. What about global engagement? And let me see if I can give a pragmatic example of that. Liz mentioned rising water. Um, in the United States, a fair bit of rising water is going to inundate extremely valuable high-end vacation properties, whereas in much of the world, we have, find that the poorest communities are at the, in the low-lying neighborhoods uh, that are going to be affected by water. And I just give that as an example of why globalization type perspective is useful. But Rod raises the point of how do we bring a global perspective into our research rather than simply a US perspective, if anybody has a perspective or wants to take that on first. Uh, Liz, looks like you're ready to talk. So. I don't know what to say about that because, you know, it's hard enough bridging the cultures in different parts of, of technology, engineering, and science, let alone when you have 
politics and different cultures involved. I have I have a friend who who works in this area, just thinking about resilience and climate change in um, in you know places like Bangladesh or Vietnam. And she spends all of her time talking to politicians. It's not about the science. It's not about the people. It's you got to get through to the politicians. And um, you know this goes to programs like CC, uh, CRA has this wonderful leadership and science policy institute that it, it uses to train people like us on how to talk to policymakers. And yeah, it's specific to some extent to the U.S. policymakers, but policymakers are policymaker. They all have um, their issues and it's useful to learn to talk to those people but i don't know if it's appropriate for you know an nsf funded scientist doing nsf funded work to go out and talk to a scientist in india there's some some optics issues there beth okay. so i wanted to call out again within our larger community we have the folks that work in ictd so uh, you know looking at technology interactive technologies uh, within the development space um, I'll call out folks like, you know, Mike Best, who I've worked with forever. Um, one of the fun things about Mike's work uh, is he did quite a bit of work on election monitoring and understanding um, how social media could be used to look for, you know, potential challenges in local elections. And he worked in, uh, you know, Kenya and many places in, in, in Africa for years. Um, and then only also oh recently has uh, those techniques and teams and uh, technologies actually been quite helpful in understanding uh, in some sense the vulnerability of our elections here in the US. So I, I agree with everything Liz said in terms of, you know, it is an extra level of investment and support. And I knew, I know, for example, um, longstanding work between Georgia Tech and the country of Liberia. Um, it you know you had to have a long trusted partnership that that did that did work through kind of that political alignment as well as research alignment. But if you can make that sustainable, making those institutional investments, which in this case both sides did, um, it unleashed kind of a flurry of, of tremendously uh, innovative, impactful research that has now found a home in uh, application in other countries, including the U.S. Chris. Yeah, I was going to sort of go back to this sort of systems view that it's good to have different organizations looking at different things at different phases. And so one thing that I think we could do is um, take, take a careful look at what are the research priorities and themes that are being amplified in other places where people recognize and have deeply thought about different problems. Um, there's, there's no reason we have to think of everything um, here in the United States in terms of what's a worthwhile direction. But we get great hints. Um, uh, I, I love the way Europe has, for example, spearheaded um, discussions around privacy. And, um, and it's, you know, it's possible to leverage the fact that there are different people thinking about different things and to learn from that. Yes. Thank you. So now let me, I'm going to riff on something Chris just said and try to take us to the other, the other theme of a lot of the talks, which was related to the, the ideation process and the, the building up on, uh, you know, a building on a sequence of steps and the sort of tire tracks of investments and cross filtering stuff. And I, it all looks so wonderful. And I want to push back a little bit and, and say, where does that system go wrong? So Chris, for example, talks about baton passing between agencies and between places. And Beth just talked about this collaboration between Georgia Tech and Liberia that had to be nurtured over a long period of time. Where do we find the opportunities to nurture those activities over a long enough time that we get the kinds of synergies that we've been talking about here in a world in which NSF will fund you for maybe three years, DARPA, the DARPA PM is only there for three years. Um, and if we and we leave the researcher almost sort of desperately trying to do the baton pass from one agency to another, um, what do we, how do we deal with that situation? Chris? Well, um, two things. Um, first, I'm not sure that it's the researcher's responsibility to do that. Um, they need to communicate well and inspire. But um, people, people in um, other organizations need to be listening. It's like that, you know, the 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 the, the themes need to be heard, um, and the relationship between them needs to be understood. So, there's probably value in that. Um, 
But I want to I want to I wanted to say a little bit about um, to pick up on um, Liz's mention of Thomas Kuhn because I think um, to some extent um, uh, ideas do have a lifespan um, of you know that is related to the um, people who are driving driving those ideas um, and one thing that I thought was interesting um, is that um, there are these sort of paradigm shifts in computer science where um, uh, the, even the research you're doing is not commensurable with, um, say, the industrial deployments that are out there. And people talk about ossification and the difficulty of getting ideas moved across. And some of that, I think, is um, you know uh, causes causes frustration, and people don't understand why it's happening. But some of it can be root caused or diagnosed all the way down to the idea that. Sometimes research is happening in a different paradigm, and it just doesn't connect to the things that are going on, on out in the world. Um, and so you see that with you know uh, the bellheads and the netheads, and, and the incommensurability of some of the networking research, or in software-defined networking versus sort of wide-area internetworking, different assumptions around centralization and so forth. So I think we need to be attuned to the big paradigms that are going on and figure out where we are playing in those. And it's particularly hard in computer science because we sort of make our own physics. Um, and, uh, you know, there's nothing, um, you know, in nature that says we need to be following, you know, uh, one networking um, paradigm versus the other. Those are, those are matters of community choice and taste in many cases. And, and so we need to be paying attention to these themes and the music that's playing in the background. Yeah. Um, I'm just having great fun listening to Chris. This is, um, I think this is, this is tremendous. And I, I wanted to go back, uh, Craig, to one thing that you said in the question, but then uh, come back to Chris's comments at the end. I mean, who said three years is the magic um, amount of time to make research happen? Um, and, you know, for example, you know, I pulled up, um, you know, so apologies to my, my collaborators, but our very early example of trying to create this notion of arenas within the AI Institute that has all of the luxurious five years uh, to, to pull something together. But we are arguing with this question, and I saw it in the chat, about how do you have fundamental advances? So in this case, the charge is fundamental advances in AI, but that are at least in conversation with, in some way, inspired, grounded, fueled, you know, from the perspective of use and from the perspective of, of what it means, for example, to be an aging adult with early stage Alzheimer's. So it is, it is this amazing challenge of, as Chris was saying, you know, inventing our own physics, right? You know, always still staying on that edge of invention in terms of, of what we can create, but in the absence of like, ooh, wouldn't it be great if the system could, you know, teach a graduate student how to make a four course meal, would it be great if the system was actually based on um, like what happens in, you know, real homes with families struggling, and in many cases getting a you know a deeper a deeper inspiration than the types of scenarios that often fuel the work we do. So I do feel like it's you know it is a it is a potential. There are potentials to make this happen, but it can't always be in three years. It can't always be on the backs of junior researchers to pass batons. Right, other organizations such as the NSF and the institutions that we represent have to be making those investments to set up those larger conversations and collaborations. So I'm just gonna make a meta point. When I got started, DARPA was giving out six to eight year grants to universities. Mm -hmm. and so you would fund somebody on an initiative for that long, which effectively took graduate students from cradle to, you know, the start, the very start of their graduate program to the PhD, and you had a stable of ideas come out. Um, nobody, surprised I can tell, does that anymore, except maybe NRL at some informal level in the United States. Um, so yes, I, I completely agree, and I, this three-year thing, you know, or four-year thing drives me crazy, but. Um, and I think we, we need to think deeply about that. It also reduces the number of baton passes, which I think is an important step here and gives people longer to create connections for where their work may go as it evolves, which I would love to see. But um, let me let me come back to something Chris said in this. Oh, sorry, Liz, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just gonna, this goes back to my, um, we need to educate the policymakers 
because the NSF, that three-year business of the NSF is not necessarily because of the NSF. It's because the NSF is called on the carpet to say, what have you done to, for me lately? And that co they're called on the carpet fairly frequently. So if we can educate the policymakers and help the NSF make the case that long-term investment is really important. And like that wonderful story that Ponch told this morning about this young girl who, well, she was a young girl when she uh, was working on NSF funded research when she was a high schooler. And now she's a career award winner and professor at Caltech. Those kinds of stories make it clear that long-term investment really bears fruit. And so that's something that, you know, I'm sure the NSF would like to do, but they're probably, and I don't know the politics here, but I would be willing to bet they're getting pressure from above. And like, remember the Golden Fleece Awards, anything that doesn't look great, you don't fund. So we need to educate our policymakers, which, you know, right. <laughs> So, so okay, Chris, uh, you're up. You're muted. So yeah. Well, I'm, I'm gonna. Um, I'm just gonna um, remember a little bit about uh, David Patterson's lectures on how to build a bad research center. And um, he chose. I mean, his philosophy was to choose to to choose a shorter time, a fixed shorter time horizon, and um, explore an idea um, so that there is a clear end goal. And um, there, you know, he's been very successful um, at doing that. And so. I'm not sure that um, having longer funding time horizons is consistent with that idea. Um, so just throw that out for discussion. I'm gonna push back on that one, which is to say that what you do actually is you need to have smaller sprints within that you know, longer time frame. absolutely. But one of the things that gives you the confidence to envision the next sprint sometimes is the knowledge that you have Perhaps not all the money you need, but you have enough money to support at least one graduate student and a little bit and get it started. And then you can go off and get the additional money coming in. It's sort of it's a it's a level of sustained support that doesn't force you sort of two years into this push to say, okay, this push has to wrap up because I got to write the proposal that's going to get me the next push. And it also right. doesn't allow you in your first push to screw up. And I, I you know, a, a good example. I mean, yeah, I always loved my Dave, my friend Dave Ten, uh, Dave, sorry, Dave Cheriton at Stanford, who had a substantial funding cycle for distributed systems. Some of Dave's ideas did not pan out, but they led him to other ideas that did, and that was part of a long-term framing in which he was, you know, pushing in multiple directions at once. So that was, I, I just want to point out, I, I actually love Dave's keep yourself focused, but there's a question of resources to allow you to have that focus. Yeah, and also just the time invested in writing proposals can become overwhelming if you have to do it too frequently. So that doesn't seem like a very healthy uh, environment either. Right, at a 10% funding rate, yes. You know, mm -hmm. I, I tell my tenure track professors, if you don't figure out how to improve your proposals so they've got at least a 25% chance of being funded, you, know, you end up having to submit on the order of three good proposals a year in the hopes you'll get at least one by the time your tenure consideration comes up, you know, just, and so, yes, so there are all sorts of issues there as well. Yes. Um, so I wanted to take, come back to something Chris said a few minutes ago, which was about getting ideas across between, you know, the sort of between industry and research and other communities, but we're moving towards a world where a lot of times what you need is the raw data, right? Mm -hmm. We're in a world of, you know, vast amounts of data, that if analyzed and considered with an open mind or a different perspective can yield tremendous insights. And yet that data often ends up getting locked down in some particular corporation's uh, archives or, or you know, on their servers somewhere. And I'm reminded of the early days of the internet where a lot of our research ideas came from a, a grad student turning on a packet printer and discovering all the disastrous things that were happening on the wire and going, why is this? What caused this? What does this tell us about where networking needs to go? Where does it tell us about where distributed systems need to go? And I just worry that there's all this data out there that we're not sharing um, and that that idea is actually the, the pre-stage to having the ideas to share. And how do we get around that problem? And Beth probably popped her hand up and I saw Liz nodding. So obviously I answered, asked something right. Go Liz. Oh, oh, Beth, Beth was first. Beth, sorry. Beth. <laughs> it's like Jeopardy. I was in there. Right. Well, you guys keep um, switching on my screen. So it's like, whoops, I'm looking here and then suddenly there's another person there. All right, go. I'm just going to say quickly that data sharing was the first reason we started to invent arenas within the AI Institute. It was a structured way 
to bring together people producing, curating, grabbing data um, from the youth-inspired world to share it with AI researchers in a number of different ways. Um, it's from IRB and data curation and all these other issues, it doesn't make sense to say, ooh, everybody has everything, have edit, because you also have to know how to make sense of that data and how to work with that data. So arena, data was really the first reason that we created arenas, and now we're creating other opportunities around it. So yes, agreeing with you, Craig, and what I'm arguing for is that I think there's, if we can create these collaborations, sustainable collaborations with underserved uh, communities, then creating a space for arenas and data to fuel um, a wide range of set of researchers um, is incredibly important. When I talked about those unicorns, right, those people who had done it all on their own, what we typically saw under the hood was figuring out by hook or crook, having a data manager uh, in the project team to be able to facilitate that. So that's, that's one of the, the secrets of the sauce, but we need to make that easier. Yep. So I'll agree with everything Beth said. Um, and I would also, um, the, the, the CCC and the CRAs, um, and Yolanda, I heard on this call before, so she's probably nodding her head if she's there. Um, she co-led a, a community research roadmap for artificial intelligence, maybe five, five, four or five years ago. And that re recommended, among other things, the AI Institutes. This is a you know large report submitted to the NSF. One of the other big recommendations was centralized repositories for, the, for data that people could use to, to basically road test their algorithms to get around this problem of everything being inside Google. By the way, there's a second, uh, a second and not very nice implication of all the data being inside the big companies, which is that people who stock and trade as machine learning are leaving academia, not so much because their salaries will double, but because they'll have access to tremendous amounts of data. So it's a cause of brain drain. But no, this is one of the recommendations, the big recommendations in that roadmap that um, have not quite been followed quite as much as the, let's get an AI Institute in every state. Yolanda, if you're listening, feel free to chime in in the, the uh, Publio and I'll read it out. <laughs> All right, Chris. Publio, whatever it is. Uh, I would just wanted to put in a plug for um, research on methods that don't require so darn much data. Um, you know, humans um, seem to manage without, um, uh, you know, quite quite as much. And um, if we figure out how to incorporate prior knowledge and do clever things, maybe uh, maybe there are ways that can reduce that dependency. And I also wanted to mention that um, the CRA had uh, has recently launched an, uh, a group called CRA Industry, um, where we've been taking a hard look at the implications of cloud computing for research. And um, so there's an ongoing discussion on that, which includes data and other things as well about operating at scale. So, um, you know, cloud computing is clearly a huge impact on uh, research overall. And data is just one part of that um, that we need to think about. And certainly methods that don't need much data aren't going to create quite as much of a carbon impact. Yep. Good point. Here, here. So I'm going to move back to another topic that came up early, and that was about ethics in general. And um, one of the issues, and it was mentioned, of course, in part in the National Academies report, but, but comes up again and again, is that most of the people who are currently professors are not trained in ethics. Um, and there are you know, issues of how do you um, encourage those discussions? Um, and I, speaking from my perspective, I actually co-created a course on ethics and technology, uh, which we now teach. We, we now teach overwhelmingly. It's gone from seven students to about 400 students in two years. Um, and I turn out to rotate amongst professors in the philosophy department. And I'm discovering that that is a fascinating process of actually learning that they each professor has their own dimensions on ethical questions and such that's um, some is is of great fun. 
So I'm learning tremendously, but that doesn't extend to the rest of my department. In mm -hmm. fact, my department's now saying I'm doing this terrible thing of sending them students who are actually far more prepared to discuss the ethical issues in their courses than the faculty is. And, and how do I save them from this unfortunate situation, <laughs> <laughs> which is embarrassing to their dignity? Um, and so I just want to get a perspective on how we deal with these sorts of things going forward. And uh, Liz, I gather you're up. Yeah, so um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking back again to Barbara Gross. Who, who led that report, she has this wonderful thing. I don't know how do you pronounce it. It's ethics with, with CS capitalized at Harvard. And she did the same thing. She had, um, she had two teaching fellows for her class, one from philosophy and one from computer science. And they developed something that actually scaled that other, other professors could deploy. But my reaction was, I could never get TA, two TAs for a course. I can't even get one. So I'm with you. Um, and yeah, I, I have, uh, I went to the ethical culture school in New York, so I have a bit of ethics training, but I think I'm a bit of a unicorn in that regard. So I'm going to stop talking before uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Chris, do you want to chime in here a bit? Or? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know um, how to build it into every research endeavor, um, but it seems like there are other fields that, um, for example, in biology, um, some, some, some schools don't even let you into a wet lab until you've taken an ethics course and made that a foundation. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm sort of drawing inspiration internationally going back to that global question. I feel like um, it would be interesting to do for computer science, something like what um, the Canadian engineers have done um, with their iron ring ceremony. And um, you know, a, you know, a tangible reminder of what can go wrong if we don't, um, uh, you know, consider more points of view and um, and build uh, uh, build ethics and social responsibility into our research agendas. Um, so I feel like there's a community effort that that could go into um, you know figuring out who is the Rudyard Kipling of our age that can craft the ceremony of the formation of a computer scientist. And, um, and just make sure that we start thinking about it earlier in our careers. Beth. So two points, um, the second, because Chris set me up. Um, on, the, on the first point, I think, you know, Barbara's curriculum is great. We are doing this type of integrated approach at Northeastern. I do think it's important for us when we think of integration and we start to think of it as, let's say, applied ethics, right? So it's, it's less about kind of the major philosophers and you know passing a philosophy exam, you know go watch the good place. Um, but it's more about uh, understanding the ethical trade-offs in a machine learning class or the ethical trade-offs, you know, in a design class or the ethical trade-offs in a networking class. You know, building up those types of case studies, I think it allows it to be much more accessible, um, much much easier to engage our students, and perhaps gets us past the the cold start problem. Um, with our with our faculty as well. So um, I used to teach the traditional ethics class, and they didn't like it. I didn't like it. Um, it's it's you know it's less kind of like grand philosophy and more like you know what do you need to know and how to apply it. Um, because we do hear from the students, they would say, okay, oh okay, oh no, there's all these ethical ramifications. But if we don't give them the tools to then wrangle with that then they just say, oh my goodness, I'm going to avoid unintended consequences and then go on my way. Um, and that, that gets us nowhere. Um, the second I can't resist because Chris brought it up, um, at the Corey College at North, Northeastern, we have adopted um, our own professional oath of computer science. Um, and we uh, deployed that uh, in our first graduation ceremony last spring. And I actually just finished reading it uh, at the convocation to all of the first year students. So essentially we read them the oath and said, this is your journey. We're launching you on this journey. We're gonna support you uh, every step of the way. And when you graduate, here is the oath that you will read. So it's uh, you know an N of one institution, but it's something that the students have responded to so positively um, as well as, as their parents who were at graduation that this is way more than a technical education at this point. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I am going to comment on ethics. I, I'm a believer in introducing them to a fair bit of the moral theory, mostly um, because I find that computer scientists, for whatever reason, instinctively are utilitarians. 
and I have to convince them that there are other perspectives on the problem that they might wish to consider because utilitarianism just appeals in many ways to the way we tend to think about problems. Oh, we break it up and we look at the different communities and we look at the different trade-offs and we sort of add it all up and sum up the total and say, oh, this is good. And, you know, we're potentially good and we should proceed forward and to say, well, have you got anybody's consent? <laughs> <laughs> which is, of course, a Kantian perspective. It's something that you want to bring into, into that perspective as well. So we're in our last couple of minutes. So what I'm actually going to do, rather than craft an additional question, since we've gotten through all the questions in the in Hublio, and I think we've gone back and touched on many of the themes that we touched in our talks, is to invite each of you to talk, sort of talk for one minute about things that you think either need to be repeated or that we missed, or that in hearing all of this discussion, you really think uh, should be an emphasizing point as we uh, finish off our, in our last few minutes. Um, is there any um, person willing to volunteer to go at it here to start us off? And I just saw Chris click his microphone on, so I will take. I'll, this up on it. I'll take a stab at it. Um, so you know, computer scientists are great at abstraction, and um, and people think hard about like computing machines of various kinds. And I think it'd be really fun to think about um, the research enterprise as a computing machine that um, produces results. So maybe I'm being too utilitarian, Craig. Um, um, but I feel like um, you know, over the next day and a half or so, we have uh, a number of um, other sessions that are able to pick up on this theme. Um, for example, um, you know, uh, how do we build um, other communities into the research process? Um, so there's a discussion on new research models and um, you know, uh, we have the TIP um, organization being formed in the NSF, which is an actionable instrument. We have um, new visioning groups and, um, and uh, like the CRA industry that are coming together to bring, bring communities together with baton passing. So I guess um, I'm, I, I feel um, like, you know, this, this, this whole forum is happening at a time and a place uh, when there's a lot of actual um, impact that can come out of the other end. And so I really am um, looking forward to the next uh, you know, day and a half of discussions on all of these topics. So just to, to build on with, with Chris, and you know, it, it really is a systems problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just the system is much different uh, than the ones that we initially studied. Um, and have traditionally worked on. And so, you know, looking at it from how this larger socio-technical system works, how we create that ecosystem to support that research, you know, we need new kinds of data. We need new types of research training. We need new types of observatories where those observatories happen to be significant partnerships with underserved communities. Um, we need to go back and not just ask the question, what should we be studying in computer science research, but very much the how. So that was Liz's, uh, Liz's point. Um, and, it, and it may not be you know, traditional three-year grants where you already know the question and have the solution. And it may not be a classic computer scientist and maybe with a, an extra social scientist thrown in the mix, right? We, we have to go back and question some of the fundamentals. And that doesn't mean that anything is, has been done wrong, um, but it means it's time. Um, and that's part of the maturation of our field that we have to embrace. Wonderful. Liz, you get the last word. Yeah, and there's, it looks like there's about 30 seconds left, so it will be half a word. But yeah, I love the idea of a systems level approach to recrafting the field of engineering, to com of computer science and engineering and how to do it. And I think it's not just a socio-technical problem. I keep coming back to a socio-political and technical problem and the education that we need to do and how much of this needs to come top down. And how this goes back to the Karen Sullins question in the chat, which we never got to, which is how these are cha hard changes. How do you do this? It has to, it can't be bottom up. It can't be the assistant professor saying, you need to tenure me, even though I, you know, didn't get a grant. It has to come from above. So, yeah. Those of us in the leadership, it's incumbent upon all of us to figure this out and, and help those above us let it trickle down. Wonderful. I think that's an excellent last word. And with that, I will wrap up the session. I believe uh, Matt or someone is going to make a brief logistical announcement to close us off here. But um, I want to thank you all for, the, for an interesting discussion. And I hope that our participants had a great time.